Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome you to another Perfect Mind Yoga Series webinar. Uh, if you can hear me talking, please just type yes in the chat box. Just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Fantastic. Okay, just before we start, I'm just going to let you know what the flow of the webinar will be today. Um, we're excited to have Mr. Mark Laham. I'm going to give him a brief introduction in just a moment. Um, after Mark covers some material, I myself, John Malik, will cover some material briefly. And then at the end of the webinar, we're going to open up a question and answer period where we'd like you to ask as many questions as you may have generated from the webinar or any thoughts you had that were generated from the webinar. Um, it's an open environment. We really encourage you to share. If you want to chat in the chat box during the webinar, that's fine. But we do kindly ask that you reserve your questions until the end of the webinar. If you're having any trouble with a sound or seeing any of the visuals in the webinar, you can definitely type in the chat box and one of us will help you out. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction to Mr. Mark Lahan. Mark has been featured in several conferences as both a workshop leader on the mat and a business coach off the mat. Most recently, he presented at the Vancouver Yoga Conference where he was asked to present his popular Buddha business class. He is a seasoned teacher trainer and enjoys assisting other professionals in growing both their teacher training programs as well as their regular student base while he keeps his finger on the pulse of the industry trends. If you haven't already seen him in one of his various DVDs that are all bestsellers online, you can also check him out at www.mindbodywarrior.com. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Lahan. Well, thank you for that introduction, John. It's always nice to be referred to as a mister. It kind of sounds official. <laughs> um, so welcome, everybody. I'm really, really, really stoked that you're all uh, joining us today. And, uh, you know, such an amazing topic, uh, uh, marketing with integrity. Uh, and the key word, I think, there being integrity, because often enough we place, um, you know, negative associations with that word marketing. And there's a lot of it's kind of like this big monster that we kind of look at from afar, and a lot of us don't want to approach it. So what we want to do today is kind of, uh, you know, um, help you guys out to, to figure out how you can market your services with integrity so that you can best, um, you know, I guess well, what it says right there, represent the intentions of your business, um, which means that you have to know what the intentions of your business are first. But um, it's, you know, well, we'll go through a little bit of how marketing, you know, can help you out and all, and all sorts of things, but really kind of you know, um, creating a, a more positive association with it so it's a fun part of your business. And learning how to narrow down your markets a little bit uh, so that you ensure that all of your efforts that you're putting out there are attracting the specific audience that's going to best serve them and you at the same time. Uh, we'll also, you know, cover some really good examples of external and internal marketing. And we'll go through all that a little bit later on. Talk a little bit, John's going to really talk a lot about how to measure your marketing and, and how to generate more awareness with less effort, so which is the key thing. It's like, how can I put, you know, little in and get more out, you know, um, good return on your investment. And, and also how to measure that cost of, uh, per inquiry, like, so how much money you're putting in and what you're getting back uh, with, with that money that you're putting in as well. Um, and I think that first part that we spoke about, about getting comfortable with the uncomfortable, getting comfortable with marketing, uh, learning to associate good feelings, good positive feelings with that aspect of your business. You know, it's like uh, why I always, you know, insist in my yoga classes um, that, that people smile when they're in really challenging poses or why, um, you know, I, I try to add humor and entertain a little bit in, in my classes is because if they are on the mat and they're having a good time and they have a smile on or they're, you know, like physiologically there's a lot going on there and they'll start to literally in their brain, their brain will start to wire itself to have an association of hey, fun with that part of your business because from the yogis that I talk to, you know, they're, who are in their business because they love what they do, but when it comes to that aspect of things, you can see in their body language, as soon as that comes up, that topic comes up, um, you're lucky I can't see you guys right now because I probably see maybe some of that in your bodies, but uh, it, you can see the discomfort that comes up with it. And if, you're, if, you're, if you keep that association going, then you're going to be less likely to want to put your attention on, uh, on the marketing. Whereas if you can start to associate some fun, like I, I literally... Uh, and even more and more these days of finding it, you know, that is one of the funnest parts of my business because it challenges me also to, to look at things a little differently. 
So, um, you know, and like I said, anything that you associate fun with, you're going to be more willing to put your attention onto it. And it's just not going to be one of those chores that you have to do. Oh, like I got to, you know, I got to sit and work on my marketing now, or I got to sit and work on, you know, um, whatever aspect of your business. It's like, okay, well, Hey, I got, I, today I got, I, you know, I, I've got time spent, uh, to, to really focus on my marketing efforts and see what's going on and see where they're going and see what's coming in. So, um, you know, ultimately, what to, to really kind of start to break that association, I mean, really marketing, when it comes down to it, is, is common sense. And, you know, and, and I know a lot of people who've taken, you know, studied marketing and have MBAs and this and that. And, and, um, and you know what? They all say that same thing. I say, oh, yeah, you know, I should have taken like a marketing degree or a marketing class. And they're like, you know what? It's really, it's really just common sense, you know. And, and I, I've heard that from many of their mouths. And so we'll kind of break through some of the myths of it and, you know, detail a little bit how you can go about uh, starting with your marketing plan and your marketing efforts and, and where you want to take your business. So, so how, how do we make it fun? How can you actually start to associate fun with your business and um, you know there's a few things that you can do and, and make, again it comes down to association when you associate fun when there's a link in your brain even your group of neurons that represent marketing links to a group of neurons that represents fun you know when that marketing fires those those neurons um, uh, that associate fun will fire too and, and literally you'll, you'll feel that in your physiology so one thing you can do is pick a time of day where you feel the best you know, what time of day do you feel, you know, most happy? And for everyone, it's probably a different time of day. And, and it's a matter of you just understanding w when that is for you. And, and just allocate a little bit of that time for, for your marketing efforts. Because already, you're going to be, um, you know, in a, in a good mood. Um, another thing I like to do, um, when I, especially when I first started with the marketing, I, you know, it was my mentor, actually, who gave me this idea, Scott McFall. Awesome, awesome guy. Knows a, he's, the guy's been doing things for 30 years, just a whiz when it comes to marketing. Um, I, you know, I started playing music that I really enjoy, music that gets me in a good mood. Um, some people I know put pictures around that inspire them. You know, there's, there's, you know, sayings, quotes somewhere around you, but, or a picture of one of your teachers or one of your loved ones, but anything that will, you know, trigger those neurons that will fire in your brain that, that, that make you feel good so that you can associate that feel good to that aspect of your business. You know, and I hope I hope people understand how important that is because I am also, um, you know, I come from a little bit of a hypnosis background and behavioral change management, and you know, it's and really uh, when it comes down to it, is we're all it's all about these relationships that we make. So that if you have a negative relationship to the marketing aspect, how are you going to that that is going to show? So as you develop, you know, your marketing plans or advertisements or or whatever it is, however you're trying to get at it. That association, that if you're feeling negative about it, it's going to come out and, and the, the clients or the people watching your ads or the people listening to you are going to feel that without knowing it. It's a subconscious thing. So it's, it's this, this you know, may seem like something simple, but very important to start to associate fun with what it is you're doing here. And that can go true with any aspect of your business that you're feeling uncomfortable with. Um, it, it, ultimately, if you really want to you know, connect with people, um, you, you, you know, there's so many marketing messages being thrown at them throughout their day and how are they going to know about your great services about these awesome practices that you're trying to share with people that you know are going to serve them you know it's going to benefit their lives right but how are they going to know about it if you're not out there trying to get their attention amongst all of the other stuff and and it's again it's not that hard and it's just a matter of you know um, being a little smart about it, being a little organized about it, which we'll, we'll kind of break down through this presentation. So what are you marketing? Okay, so once you've figured out how to associate fun, once you start to associate those good feelings with, with marketing, now you've got to figure out, okay, so what, it is, what is it that you're marketing? And do you know what your overall vision is? Do you know what your overall business is about? We spoke a little bit about this in the last uh, webinar. And, uh, and, you know, what I, what I found was when I'm coaching people in their business, initially when I ask them that question, they, they don't. <laughs> they don't know. They, they just haven't, they haven't really given it much thought. They're, hey, I'm a yoga teacher. I'm out there teaching. And they're just going to be willing to teach whoever, whenever, whatever. And, you know, at the beginning, that's cool because, you know, you're, you're just starting out and you're figuring out your groove. And that's what I was doing when I first started out. But as I, as I went along, it became harder. and It was kind of like I was chasing my own tail. 
I was putting a lot of attention, a lot of effort into it, but it seemed like I wasn't getting a lot back. And so I was out there doing whatever I could, standing in front of anybody who wanted to listen to me talk about it. Um, and then I, you know, like through some really good teachers that I've had, but also mainly through my mentor, I started to understand how to organize my attention and my efforts and my, and my actions so that it was a lot more fruitful and I was getting a lot more in return for the amount of effort I was putting in. And also at the end of the day, like I said, I was reaching more people that, that really needed this stuff. So, so the point is not, you know, behind drawing more people and is really for me not to make more money. I, I want money. I think money's important. I think I need it for resources to grow my business and, and all that, but it's not my purpose. It's not for me to acquire money. And, and it, it really the purpose is to, um, to, I mean, to share a lot of this stuff with people and be more effective in sharing it with them. So, um, you know, one thing you've got to ask yourself when you're creating your vision is, you know, does it match your purpose or your dharma or, you know, why you're here? And that's a topic that, you know, is, it's a webinar or, a co or like a weekend course in and of itself of understanding what your purpose is. And just briefly on that, I used to believe that my, you know, my purpose was my job so that, you know, I, I Mark Laham, is a yoga instructor and my purpose is to come and teach people yoga. But what I later understood was that your purpose is way more than that. Your purpose is something that you live in all aspects of your life, not just in your, your business or your career, but in your relationships and your romantic uh, encounters in your, in your, you know, daily life, in your relationship with your family, you know, in your relationship with yourself. Are you living your purpose there? And and, you know, ultimately, when you link your purpose in, in your bi business, then you know you're coming from the heart, you're coming from the right place, you're coming from a place of power, instead of, a, you know, a place of, of ego or, or just, you know, kind of thoughts that, that have been programmed into your mind. So really taking the time, and there's all sorts of great, you know, resources out there. You know, I've, I give a workshop, it's a, like I said, a two-day workshop called the True Potential Workshop, and it's, and it's all about finding what your purpose is. And then, once you know that, you link it into your business. Um, and you'll be way more effective that way. Like just, it's, it's, you know that it's the right place to be. You, you have the motivation, you have the heart, you have the power behind you. And, and then ultimately, once you've, you know, um, linked your purpose to your business now, can you now communicate this vision to your clients in a way that is, that they can easily go out and tell others about it? I, you know, when I first started out, you know, I was just a yoga instructor. And, and so what? I was a yoga instructor amongst many other yoga instructors. Um, and then as I started to refine my business and refine, uh, you know, where I was focused, as you'll see in a little bit with the example that I give, it became more and more clear how I could describe to them how what I did so that I stood out. And I really, like, it was something that was very different. And they could very easily then go out and tell other people and refer other people to me. And, and word of mouth, you know, is, is a great thing. So it, it just, you could see, I could see how the business started, you know, flourishing. Because just something as simple as learning how to explain what it is you do properly to people. So, you know, I hope that makes sense to everybody. So as, as an example, uh, you know, after... Uh, you know, kind of going through uh, all sorts of exercises and figuring out what my purpose was, it also it came down to you know to inspire others to live their true potential. You know, in in finding my purpose and find in living my dharma, it turned out that my dharma was to help others. You know, and to inspire others to do the same thing because I you know I wake up every morning and I'm ecstatic and I love what, you know what I'm about to do and I'm excited and I wish that upon everybody. You know, I wish that everybody wakes up feeling the same way I do every morning you know, and, and living what they need to be living, living their life on purpose. Um, just a, on off topic, well, not off topic, but a really great um, author, Wayne Dyer, talks a lot about that stuff, read a lot of his books or any of his books, and they usually touch upon that topic in, in some good detail. So how can you, um, I bring that purpose into my business was the question. How can I link that into what I was doing? Um, and ultimately, it, 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 it brought me into understanding who my target market was, who I was trying to reach. Um, and, and, you know, we'll talk right now actually um, about kind of narrowing down a little bit your market. And there's something called the 80-20 rule, otherwise known as the Pareto principle. And so the Pareto principle states that 
for many events, roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. Um, and so in marketing or in business, I should say, uh, they say that 80% of your revenue comes from about 20% of your clientele. So 80% of your revenue coming from a certain 20%. The, the question is, who is that 20% for you? Now, it's not only true in this principle, is not, you'll find it in, in, uh, elsewhere. And in fact, if you look at um, about 80% of your results in your business tend to come from about 20% of your actions and your efforts that you put in. So if you look at some of the key, 20% of the key tasks that you perform, they're generally responsible for about 80% of, of your functioning business. So it's a, it's a, it's a, really, it's a principle that this apparently is found, you know, like all over the place. And it's um, finding out what that 20% is for you is a pretty important tool because it helps you then narrow down things. So as an example, my 20% turns out, you know, to be um, t females from the age of 25 to 40 who are considering or potentially in the middle of transitioning from a career that they initially thought they wanted into teaching yoga or running a studio full time. It, you know, and I guess it, probably because I made that transition from software development, you know, for five years into, into you know, uh, where I was very unhappy into, um, you know, entering into this field that, that like I said, from, from day one has been nothing but fun and exciting and, you know, so fulfilling in so many ways. So knowing that, you know, looking at, okay, you know, examining that 20% that of my, uh, these clientele were giving me about 80% of my income, it allowed me to refine, you know, my purpose and, and how I explain my business to this specific group. Um, and so, you know, what you see on the screen right now, so in combination with exist, so, uh, existing training and mentor programs that I offer, I also work with yoga teachers and school owners who love teaching yoga but want to break through the limiting belief that it's hard to make a living as a yoga teacher. So through online and, and, and live events, I, I, I help them understand and develop their business skills required to share this, like these wonderful teachings with other students and at the same time actually you know, make a good living about it. So you know, narrowing down to this group meant that I could now start to uh, market it in a way that was more tailored towards them. And so it refined my, the way I was, I was presenting my message. It, it was way more effective for them specifically. They were getting, the, the target market, which I was affecting mostly, was getting so much more out of it because of that. But, but ultimately, what it also did was it, it made my efforts a, a little easier because I also knew where, where to go to find more of this target market that's giving me most of my income. And so, uh, you know, one, once I this, uh, you know, figured out who this market was, I then had to, now went to the existing clientele that I, that I had and, uh, you know, pick their brains on, you know, what their interests are, what their wants are, what their desires are, what their fears are, like, what is it they're, you know, what is it they want in life? What is it they're going for? Where, where, what is it they're seeking? You know, where, where are they stuck? And, and then I was able to, you know, also find out from them. And oh, sorry, how I did that was I literally picked some of my key clientele. And in some cases, it was a phone conversation. In some cases, it was a little questionnaire I sent out. I know you can do like a lot of online questionnaires right now with, um, I don't think it's called like um, Survey Monkey or something like that. Um, I'll, I'll probably, I can get that for you guys some other time. But uh, uh, they, I also offered a, a little incentive for them to fill up these, this questionnaire. Like I gave them like a free class or a free session or 20% off, you know, some of my products as an incentive so that I can, they can honestly sit down and, and answer these questions in a way that would really benefit me so that I could, at the end of the day, make it more clear and more interesting for them and more beneficial for them. So you can go to your existing clientele. Most of them love you anyway, and they'll be more than willing to answer these questions for you. And then from there, you can figure out where, where can I go to attract more of this key clientele so that I can put less effort to going to get them and get more of them in that way. You know, I hope that, that that's clear for everybody. So once you, you know, know where this clientele is, um, you know, how you choose to market 
uh, this will, will make all the difference in the world. And, I, you know, I think this next slide is actually pretty important because often enough as, as yogis, the mistakes we make, and I, I made many of them in the, in the past, and that's, that's where I learned from, is that I, I was looking at it through my own eyes. I was looking at it through an experience, like through my own experience. So years of experience in yoga, years of, of doing what I was doing, I was thinking about it in a way that, that kind of made sense for me, but did it make sense for my clientele. So let's actually just use this example um, outside of yoga, um, the dental office, right? If a dentist is, is you know, developing a, a website or a marketing, you know, like a flyer or, or an ad in a paper, from a dentist's perspective, you know, it, it, who's thinking of preventative measures and, and to avoid cavities and gingivitis and all that kind of stuff, they tend to market it from their point of view, from the point of view of a dentist. And if you look at it, dentists are great at, at fixing teeth but horrible at running their businesses. Um, rather than looking at it from the point of view of their, their client who ultimately just wants a perfect smile, they want to look good, ultimately, let's, let's face it, ultimately people are... are, are, are very focused on how they look and how they feel because of the way they look. So, so instead of looking at it from the point of view of the dentist, what they should have been doing is looking at it from the point of view of of their clients. So, I mean, look at this picture right here in and of itself. Does that appeal to you in any way? Does look especially that one in the bottom left hand corner? Does is that something you want to look at seriously? Um, and so, the, to put that in an ad, is that going to attract someone into your into your uh, office or or is it going to repel them? I mean, I don't even want to look at that personally. I'm going to actually change it right now because I don't want to see it anymore. Uh, you know, whereas something like this, you know, which, you know, the second example here, which is a nice clean smile and, you know, someone with some healthy teeth. Well, you know, as a, as a someone going to see a dentist, which, which one would you rather see in an ad? Which one would draw you into their office more? Um, you know, so something, so it, it's something to consider. Are you looking at your marketing efforts or how you're presenting your, your services or, or for that matter, even how you're presenting the material in your classes, are you looking at it from your point of view or from theirs? So if you better understand their, your market, you better understand how to market the stuff to them, how to better represent it. What is it they're wanting? What is it they're, they're, they're needing? What are their desires? Where, where's their pain? Um, and, and, you know, um, it's very easy to look at how, you know, I used to look at my business from the point of view, oh, I just love this and I'm very passionate about it and this stuff's worked for me and I'm going to just share this stuff in the way that it worked for me and it was all about me at that point rather than being about them. Making it about them is how you're really going to serve people and so if you can start to look at it, understanding them better and, and looking at it through their eyes rather than through uh, what we call yogi eyes, you know, yogi perspective versus your audience's perspective. You know, it's simply a point of view but it but it makes a huge difference at the end of the day. You know, when, when, when you forget that your audience is coming into yoga, a lot of your audience is coming to yoga in North America anyway, with, you know, very little awareness of it, no Sanskrit understanding, no, you know, they don't understand the name of all the practices, or even if you look at some websites or ads, they talk about all these, you know, um, um, sorry, I'm skipping to the next slide a little bit, but, you know, like, it's, how can you, put it in a language and in a context that they're going to understand you know and and avoid terms and images that 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 are going to basically intimidate them and draw them away right and and that's a and i think it's a mistake that's so commonly made in the yoga world like listing the types of yoga classes like kundalini and vinyasa hatha flow and power this flow and this and that flow and that's great you know they on your schedule have that but but in an ad or in a marketing um, efforts, you, you'd probably rather want to focus on what benefits they're going to get out of it, right? So like discussing the details of your studio rather than how it's going to benefit them, making it about them, about their needs again. You know, it always comes back to that, making it about them. How can I show them that they're going to benefit from coming to my studio or my class or my seminar or my workshop? How is it going to be more about what they're going to come out of with this in a simple way that's not going to scare them off? Um, I, you know, that's, I guess I kind of brushed on that term. It's like, think back to before you started yoga. Now, I came into yoga, uh, again, a software developer, a weightlifter. I was lifting weights for like 12 years. 
I was this big macho guy and I would see, um, you know, the yoga journal and I'd see, you know, uh, this, you know, very in shape little girl who's uh, like, you know, in this tight little clothing wrapped up, balancing on one finger with her head, feet behind her head. And, you know, t I, I would look at it and say, hey, that's, that's, there's no way I'll ever do yoga. Uh, little did I know I'd be teaching it and, and teaching teachers later, later on in my life. You know, and so it's like, are you drawing them in or are you scaring them off? Um, I, I'll, I'll show you a personal example of how I was doing a good job um, kind of scaring people off in a little bit too. Um, and it's, it's very easy to, um, to get caught in, oh, that looks cool and that, I'm impressed with it, but is it going to impress somebody who's never done it before? For instance, look at this slide. you got the images on the right. Uh, and there, there I am doing that one-arm push-up. And I actually had another ad um, a while back that I was, it was a core workshop. And I had another picture from the side profile. I was doing a one-arm, one-leg push-up. And it looked really cool. And I'll tell you, I impressed a lot of people. And it felt good for my ego, but it didn't, it scared people off. Because they're like, well, there's no way I can do that. There's no way I'm coming to this. And my whole intent for the workshop was to show them how they could develop the tools and the skills and the connectivity in their body to, to get into that. And in turn, though, what that image did was scare them off. I literally had people come up saying, ah, oh, yeah, there's no way I'm coming to your workshop. It's just too tough and this and that. Like, and so I ended up, you know, that was a great learning experience. I understood that, okay, you know, more, you know, pictures that have a nice ambiance, like that, that one where I'm doing the gecko pose there and, and there's that nice background in the window. That's a nice inviting scene, a nice, you know, relaxing, calming. It's inviting. It's, it's not scary. There's nothing, you know, that intimidating about it. But look at that girl bouncing on her elbows. I, I'm a yogi. I've been doing yoga for eight years now, and I'm I would, you know, I wouldn't want to, you know, even go near that. And and so, when you're putting together whatever it is you're putting, however, we'll talk about the internal external marketing a little bit. But whenever you're putting together your marketing plan or how you're going to represent your business on ads or, or or where else, look at it from their point of view their point of view and and it's 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 always making it about them instead of about you serving them instead of about you and, and it's something simple but it's often overlooked in the yoga world and you know as much as we say we're out there for them you know do your actions and do your do your business represent that so moving on to you know two different types of marketing so there's external marketing and internal marketing so external if you're whether you're a studio or or just a, a teacher on your own it's it's people who you have are out going out there to reach and draw in and internal marketing is marketing other products and services to the existing clientele that you already have uh, and uh, both are important we'll start with our external marketing there's all sorts of things that you can do that some cost money and some just take up more of your time and and i think both are, are good to explore and you know it all just depends on that you know time versus money do you have more time more as a resource or do you have money as a resource something like charities uh charities are really awesome a lot of my business has come from uh, just hooking up with different charities um, for, whether it be me going up and doing like a stretch class for some of the like the weekend to end breast cancer you know, I, 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 every year I've got to do the stretch, the morning stretch for the weekend end breast cancer walk. So it's a thousand people. I'm up there on the stage, motivating them, stretching them out, getting them all psyched up for their 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 um, uh, event here that they're walking all across the city. And it, it's great because I I get great exposure. I get to help them out. It's really fun. The energy is awesome, and it's it just takes about a half hour of my time to show up in the morning, get up on that stage, and do something that I love to do. Uh, but also you can also offer like for charity events like door prizes like a free yoga session or a free DVD or you know whatever else uh, free workshop uh, you know I do that all the time for corporate events for charities and and it's great because again you're helping people you're giving them an awesome service they're, you're, giving, you're giving them great benefits and uh, you know you're, you're getting more business from it community partners you know partnering up with somebody who you know, is in your community that that has a similar clientele, but is not necessarily you know uh, competing. I say in quotes um, uh, with with your product. So you know, well, for instance, myself, I, you know, I've partnered up with Perfect Mind. These guys are Perfect Mind. They're awesome. You know, we have very similar goals in mind, and we're working really well together, and we're you know promoting each other's stuff, and we're helping each other out this way. And it's a great way to you know just find people in your community that 
you think you would work well together with and just you know help each other out in those in those manners it's just it's really you know it's a networking thing ultimately too like you you know getting around and getting known and interacting with people and, and sharing what it is you're doing networking um, is an is another webinar in and of itself that that's going to come out probably in Jan January that we're going to do but to briefly talk about uh, networking um, two things very important that I see people do wrong when it comes to networking one when you enter into a room let's say at an event um, I also you know like um, you know like Chamber of Commerce and and all sorts of other events that I attend when I enter a room I don't I don't go in there thinking okay how are these who can I who can I you know who's gonna be able to serve me what am I gonna be able to get from these people I go into the room thinking okay how can I serve them how can I who you know when I'm talking to someone right away initially in my head right away I'm like okay what can I do to better serve this person how can I help this person do whatever it is they're trying to do which means I have to learn how to listen right I have to learn how to listen to what's actually going on there and and really really be curious and and um, I ultimately you have to love people <laughs> and you have to be really curious about them and you have to really want to help them out and if you don't if you don't love people uh, networking you know I see people be really awful networkers so go into a room thinking what can I do for these people and it's amazing how it benefits you in the end too number two uh, when it comes to business cards handing out business cards great business cards are awesome have a nice one handed out with your information but that but collecting business cards way more important collecting their contact information so that you can contact them because they're gonna get your card put it in a stack of others and you know probably forget about it at the end of the, of, of the, the next day so by you collecting their cards and what I like to do too is after I've talked to somebody I got their card after I've left that conversation I take a moment and write down a few key things on the back of that card because I do meet a lot of people and I want to remember specifics about that conversation especially if it's something that I can help them with so it's something to think about it's the key one of the key things in networking is just understanding them um, schools company events health and wellness stuff you know volunteering to go talk to, to I, I volunteer when I, when I get approached by a lot of schools to come in and talk and for schools high schools and that stuff I volunteer I don't ever charge and same thing with like health and wellness seminars for companies because I always end up getting a lot of corporate seminars from that um, all sorts you can check in your community be active and just go out there and search and ask questions and, and volunteer your time volunteer your time when you don't have a lot of money just go out there and talk to whoever you can and that's in front of you another thing I love doing and this one this one worked out better than a lot of the stuff that I tried was just going into doctors offices RMTs physios um, um, uh, chiropractic clinics creating a little flyer off I created it off my Mac printed it up at, at, at Staples or I sometimes even at my own printer um, and then just uh, you know I'd go in and either talk to the receptionist or if I could maybe the doctor or the or therapist themselves often the re receptionist to be honest was the better one because they're in more you know they're the ones do you know handing out flyers and information to, to the to the uh, the clients that come in and I've you know I also often in fact invite the therapist or the doctors to one of my classes so that they see what I'm about they see a little bit more of my personality they see the people coming to my classes and they're more willing to you know refer their clients to me at the end of the day uh, radio TV print ads all of those this is a really big topic in and of itself a um, lot of you know I made a lot of mistakes myself in the past Again, my mentor was really cool in helping me out understanding that world a little more. But it's still a it's a very big topic. There's formulas that you can follow that that really work well. But ultimately, it comes down to to um, you know tracking and understanding your market a little bit. And uh, and every every city, every market will will respond a little differently to to what you're doing. So it's 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 something that it's a little you play with it a little bit. Um, and again, another seminar will be coming up or a webinar, sorry, in the new year about, about this topic in and of itself. And then social media is, you know, these days the, the thing, and you know, it's uh, it's amazing if you learn how to use it properly um, and uh, become more efficient with your time with it. How it can, you know, sometimes very quickly bring you a lot of business. Um, and that's again another webinar in and of itself that we can talk all about. And I believe uh, the guys at Perfect Mind have a webinar that you can check out uh, that can give you some really good topic, um, good ideas to, to think about. 
Now, internal marketing is uh, sometimes people don't really even think about that, like marketing to your existing clientele. And I, you know, to me, it's I think it's, it, it's amazing how much more business I get from that than anything else. It's like referrals, you know. So offering an incentive for your clients, so if they refer somebody, they get you know something in return. Uh, often enough, they'll do it just because they're getting already so much out of out of your services. It's helped them out so much, and that they're you know that they're but to remind them to 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 let them know that you know and and give them a little incentive you know i've given away free dvds free sessions um you know and discounts off of web um, seminars and trainings it's it's something that they'll really appreciate and you know if they've really gotten a lot of your your services they're they're going to be will, very easily willing to to you know go and recommend it to someone that they know uh open houses and free seminars i i, I love the free seminar thing and i i do it quite often and i Always, always, even just going to like a Lululemon store and having a free talk on some topic, you know, I, I always get people interested, signed up for, for, for workshops coming up and, and other services. Special events, uh, you know, like yoga birthday parties these days are starting to get pretty popular or, or actually something that I, you know, that's been coming up lately too is uh, bachelorette parties, you know, they're setting it up like, uh, it's not what you're thinking, though, folks. <laughs> but bachelorette parties where they'll, you know, they'll, all, all the girls will get together and do like a, you know, yoga class before they go out for the rest of the day, or go to a spa, or do whatever they're doing. And who knows, you know, us guys are cut off at that point, right? But, but it's an, you know, other little special events that you can do that that can, you know, um, draw, you know, you get people into your, you know, if you have a school and you do little birthday parties, you you offer to. Um, contact all the members and, and give them all the information this and that this way you get all their contact information they come in do a little class with your one of your teachers their kids have a good time they've seen your place now they're going to be more willing to come back to your place afterwards and again social media to keep in contact twitter is actually a really awesome tool to help get a lot of feedback from your clientele and understanding what's working and what isn't um, and uh, let me go back to that for a sec sorry and uh, you know uh, social media I think to me is where an area that I'm now putting a lot of effort into and uh, actually especially through a lot of help from uh, the guys at Perfect Mind because they they seem to really know their stuff and their product that helps you kind of do it is really good but what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to pass you guys on to John from Perfect Mind um, who's going to kind of run you through some of the uh, measuring your marketing efforts and stuff like that because he's just a pro at it and uh, I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of it. And then afterwards, uh, after his stuff, we'll uh, answer a lot of questions. So take it away, John, whenever you're ready. Thanks so much, Mark. I appreciate it. Great information. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to make sure that everybody is able to hear me. Uh, if you can hear me loud and clear, please just give me a yes in the chat box, and then I can start. Fantastic. Thank you so much. OK, so measuring your marketing efforts. So let's just say we've connected our purpose, aligned it with our vision. We now know who our audience is, and we're going to start marketing to them. Now, we all know we're going to do more than one thing to market to them. You're going to try several different things. And when it comes down to that, you really need to start measuring which one is working and which one isn't. Now, my first point, unfortunately, most of us, I'm not saying I'm perfect either, but most of us tend to guess when it comes to knowing what is working. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick example. You know, shows that there's an echo. Okay, let me just turn my sound off and back on. And thank you, Gabriel. One moment. Okay, check one, two. Hopefully it's better now. Okay, so usually when I speak to a studio owner or a teacher that's looking to build awareness in their community and I ask them, what is the main way people hear about you? What is your most popular marketing effort? The typical response I get is, oh, referrals, word of mouth. And then I ask them after that, hey, um, so for the month of January, how many referrals did you get? How, how much did that word of mouth in a quantifiable manner help you? That's when I, they start to get quiet. What's even worse if I ask them, how did that work out for you last month or a month in the past or even a year in the past? That's usually where there is zero answers. And it's really important to know those things. What's even worse is that some of us make judgments about what is working based on only the recent situation instead of looking at the big picture. So here's my example. If you host a beginner's workshop, so like an introductory workshop to learn the basics of yoga, and you host it in August, you're probably not going to receive the same level of response as if you did it in January when everybody is looking to try a new activity or fulfill that New Year's resolution to do something active. So if I ask somebody, what is your most popular marketing uh, effort right now? 
And they're only basing that off of the last month or the last two weeks because that's all they can remember and they're not tracking it. It's a really dangerous practice to get into because you might cut off something that'll work really well at another time in the year. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, I have to make sure I, I uh, communicate this correctly. Marketing is a game and we do need to keep score. And when I say marketing is a game, I do not mean that your opponent is the studio or the instructor or the teacher down the block. We're not competing with anyone. We're actually competing. Our opponent is our budget. We don't have a, a budget that is going to uh, be abundant and we always can draw upon it. Um, and I'm getting a couple of messages about my sound, so I'm gonna try one more time just to reset it. Okay, hopefully that's better for some of you. Um, if my sound does cut out, just let me know. It's probably the bandwidth on this room because we do have a decent turnout today. Okay, so we're competing against our, our number one opponent, which is our marketing budget, and we need to keep score. If we remove our opinions and just let the numbers do the talking, we'll make the right decisions about what marketing efforts we should continue to focus on and which ones maybe are time theft or something that uh, is a... Not, not a marketing campaign that's going to provide the results you need for the money you invest. So we can't think about marketing. We just have to let the numbers talk. So that leads to the biggest question, right? How do you get the numbers? What do you look at? How do you track it? There's a couple ways you can go about it. Um, one way that won't cost you any money is you can use an Excel sheet. And each time a new person comes to the studio, calls you, uh, emails you, find out how it was they heard out of you, uh, heard about you, sorry. And then in your Excel sheet, change the number of people that have heard about you that month for that particular marketing effort. Now that's gonna take you a lot of time, but it's a lot better than not doing it all. And it's a lot better than trying to do it on paper. Also, you can use a system design to make it easy for you. Uh, I'm gonna show you quickly a couple sc uh, screenshots of the system that we provide that will help you track your marketing. Right here, I'm not sure if everyone can see this, but I've circled on our member page, we track how every one of our members has heard of us. So this particular member here, Mariko Oiwaya, she was heard of through a referral. That's how she heard. How is it that we're able to pick how they heard of us? Well, you put in the different marketing efforts that you're doing, and as a result of putting those in, you can choose them. So you've got Facebook fan page, referral by member, online info form, beginner's workshop. Those are the options I can pick from in this system. I'm sure you have different options, but you can enter them in, and then any time you pick how someone heard of you, you pick from these options. If you do this, the system will spit out a report you can look at any time. So for example, I changed this one, if you look at the top right, to this week. And for this week, I can see my beginner's workshop brought in five people, Facebook fan page two, online info form six, and referrals by members, there was two. All we're trying to do is just find out you know, week to week or month to month, what's working and what's not. And if you do that, you'll know where to focus your energy. Okay, so that's a little bit about measuring what marketing is working and what marketing is not working. The other thing that Mark spoke about earlier was identifying who is your 20% and are you actually bringing those people in? So if we're looking at, if we're attracting the correct people that we envisioned or perhaps are you starting to build a new and expected niche in your area, this is something we also need to consider. A lot of successful studios ended up creating their main sources of revenue from developing a following of students that they initially didn't expect to attract. I know a lot of studios that originally thought that they were gonna be a teacher training camp, that was the type of focus they had, and they ended up just attracting the general population that wanted to reduce stress and also experience weight loss. So if you track why people are coming to you, you'll be able to evaluate both are you attracting the people that you envision in your marketing efforts? And also, are you starting to attract maybe a separate niche that you didn't expect to develop? And if you see that starting to happen, you might decide it's time to nurture that niche and continue to focus on bringing them in as well. At the end of the day, we wanna introduce yoga to everyone, right? So let's see if we're doing that and then make evaluations. Now again, the system we offer will help you with that. Here you can see this person's main interest was teacher training. And each time you get a new member, you can ask them, and why were you interested in coming to yoga? Um, the one place I would do this is on your waiver, all right? If you do it on your waiver um, or the uh, new guest form, what were your main interests in starting yoga? That's an easy way to subtly start to ask these questions. Then you just pick which one they, they uh, put down on the sheet, or if you want, you can hand them a, a computer and they can put it right in themselves through an iPad or whatever. But 
once they pick that out, from there, again, you can run the same report and see why are people coming to you? Not how they heard of you, but why is it that they were motivated to come and try yoga with you at your studio? And here you can see I've got a fairly diverse group of people coming to me. It's not all about teacher training. It's not all about stress relief. It's actually balanced. And it's really important to know that. Okay, I've got one more concept I want to share with you before we go to questions. And I thank everyone for your time today. Cost per inquiry. What is it? And why is it important? Let's go through it. Okay, so what is your cost per inquiry? How you get to this number is you take any marketing effort that you spent money on. Calculate how much money for the month that you spent. You can do this weekly, but I recommend monthly so that you're not doing it too often and wasting time. So, for example, let's say you spent $400 on something. Maybe you did a major postcard mail out. Um, maybe you had an advertisement in a newspaper or a local magazine. But let's just say for whatever reason you spent $400 on a marketing campaign. The next thing you do is you calculate how many inquiries you received from that effort. We want to count everything, phone calls, emails, people who dropped in the studio. Count that up. So let's say for the month in this example, we got eight people that contacted us or came down to the studio as a result of that marketing effort that we spent $400 on. What that means is if we divide the money we spent by the responses, the inquiries, we get our cost per inquiry. So just to finish up this example, I spent $400. I had eight inquiries. It's 50 bucks per inquiry. That was what my cost was. Don't forget that there are many marketing efforts that you actually don't spend a dime on, but they take up your time. Okay? If something takes up your time, like hosting a free workshop, it's so important that you still calculate the cost per inquiry by putting a price on your time. A really easy approach to this is ask yourself, what would I charge per hour for a private lesson? Once you have that number, you now know what your cost of your time is. I mean, essentially, if you spent two hours putting together this free workshop and you could have used that time to do two one-hour private lessons, now you know what the cost of doing this workshop really was. And because none of us have a lot of time, it's really important to do this. So I kind of said this on, on the last slide, but let's just cover it. Why do we want to know our cost per inquiry at all times? Number one, I think we can all agree we don't have money to waste. Number two, we definitely don't have time to waste. We want to share yoga with everyone and we want to do what we love, which is teach, not sit around wondering about what marketing is working. Three, because we don't have a budget that's abundant yet, we need to set a guideline for ourselves. What is the maximum we are willing to spend to generate one inquiry? And this will go up or down based on your confidence and your ability to take an inquiry and make them into a member. If every single person who walks through your doors signs up for 10 punch pass or a 20 punch pass or maybe they go on an unlimited plan for a month, if everyone is doing that, well then you know you can have a fairly high cost per inquiry. But if it's kind of 50% and not everyone signs up, some people just take a drop in and that's the last of you see of them, we need to be a little more disciplined in how much money we'll spend on our cost per inquiry because we can't lose money in our marketing. So number four, once we know our guideline, we limit all the time and all the effort we spend making sound marketing decisions. It's really simple. You just have your, your cost per inquiry. So let's say mine is, I won't spend more than $60 for each response to my marketing, whether it's my time that I put in or my money. As long as I know I won't spend more than $60, all I do is I look at the different things I did for the previous month or the previous three months. And if those uh, cost per inquiries are higher than that number, I stop doing it or I pay serious attention to how I could improve it. If they're lower, awesome. I don't need to think again. So that's how we, we calculate it, and that's why it's so important. And just the last slide here, I'm in my Perfect Mind software, and it's just a demonstration of how I use this to get my cost per inquiry. So as you can see, my estimated cost. I thought my free beginner's workshop would only take me an hour to market and prepare for. It actually ended up taking two hours to prepare. My private lesson uh, rate is $100 per hour, which means I value my time as $100 per hour which is why my actual cost of this uh, free beginner's workshop was $200 to myself. As you can see up at the top here, I generated five inquiries from doing this workshop. So lastly, I just do the math. My cost per inquiry was $200 divided by five, 40 bucks. Again, if I'm using $60 as my rule or my guideline, I now know I should do a beginner's workshop every single month and then just make sure that I'm staying under that $60 marker. 
the second it goes over, I got to decide if maybe I'll get someone else that doesn't cost as much to do the workshop for me, or maybe I need to reevaluate the whole concept. Okay, so that's it for my section, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are now ready to open up the question and answers. So if you have any questions or any comments or anything you'd like to share with the group, please go ahead and type it in the chat box. And we've got about 10 minutes to answer questions, so we're looking forward to getting it going. Okay, first question, Marita Gardner, Annapol. Uh, she has yoga, yoga special, oh, sorry. Uh, Mailing list. John, yeah. I think you have uh, quite a bit of uh, expertise. In I, certainly, I've got this one. Um, you, John, so if you want to um, just speak up. Okay, check one, two. Uh, the way that you would buy a yoga studio list, uh, First of all, I just would want to say um, buying the list and doing outbound marketing is a little bit aggressive. So uh, you might want to just put up a really strong website and find ways to draw them to the website. But if you want to buy a mailing list, uh, the company I'd recommend is either Info USA, just type it in there, or Info Canada, depending on the region that you're wishing to, uh, to serve. And what you can do is call them, and from there you'll be able to uh, purchase a list of any studio that offers yoga. And he put in a comment about social media, but that's a whole other webinar. Uh, I'll just answer that one question about the mailing list for now. Okay, next question. Go ahead and type it in. Mark, I'll leave you with that one. Uh, yoga is not their main exercise. It's a... Well, I... Sorry, I'm not sure if John's doing this. I can't... Again, I can't hear. Um, okay, uh, so I I, uh, I... I mean, I was one of those clients who never considered yoga. And... Um, it was, it was, you know, like I, I had people telling me, I had friends suggesting that I, that I, that I tried out, tried out, tried out. And I kept like, no, no, I'm a gym guy. I'm a gym guy. And, um, it, ultimately the, the, <laughs> the person who kind of finally convinced me, um, saw what, that I was struggling with. I was struggling with tension headaches all the time, all the time, all the time. So she saw my pain and she basically put it in that point of view. She goes, it's going to help you. And it's going to go. So, and, and, and. It was like understanding that, hey, this can actually help my pain brought me into that class finally because it was something that I just I just never considered. But it's like, okay, understanding that there's a good percentage of the population out there that is not doing yoga and that doesn't consider doing it, and but even though they'll benefit from it. So it's like finding out where they are going already and what they're getting out of it and how, how you think that you could, you know, show them that they'll get benefit from you know, taking your classes or, or doing yoga classes specifically. So it's like there's, and there's a huge market out there that's not doing yoga still. So um, even though they may know of it because yoga is big these days in the media, they still don't, they still wouldn't do it themselves. So how can, so you find out where they're hanging out, what they're doing, you know, what, what, where they're spending their time and where they're seeking those services and figure out how can you, you know, show them to get out of pain and into pleasure. What is their pain, and how can they how can they use this practice to get into pleasure from it? Does that make sense for new students? Um, I you know it's it again it depends on it actually kind of depends on where you are and stuff. But I mean I've honestly like um, being the, being in front of people as much as I could so that they saw my personality. Um, you know, was was a really great way because it's like they they you, it's it's you that's going to attract them into your classes ultimately. It's your personality, so it's like going out there and just sharing that enthusiasm. Um, but as far as like a specific, um, you know, areas, like I said, I mean, it, it depends on the market that you're actually trying to attract. So, so a new student, you know, from the gym area, or a new student from you know who's like an older person and you know like a hip replacement type thing you're going to you're going to look for them in different spots so again it it does you want to know who that new student is that you're trying to attract first i don't know if john do you have something to add to that yes certainly um what i've been finding for mainly the fitness wellness yoga and martial arts studios is that the number one place to find new students is definitely facebook you have to be on facebook 
the world is on Facebook, 500 million people. And people that never considered doing yoga will definitely become interested in it by seeing their friends that are a part of your fan page, by seeing photos or even better videos of a class and session that lets them know yoga is not this mystical thing that only some people can do. It's something that everyone can do and certainly everyone can benefit from. And the best part about the fact that everybody's on Facebook is that it doesn't cost you anything to connect with them to be on Facebook. Um, if you haven't seen our Facebook fan page webinar, please go check it out right after this session or whenever you have time. It's recorded. Uh, it's on YouTube. I'll just type it in right now so that you can find it. But definitely you, uh, spend as much time as you can uh, developing a strong uh, online presence through social media as well as the search engines because anyone that hasn't tried yoga yet will typically look for it online. The same way if you were going to buy a new pair of running shoes or you were going to order a pizza, you are going to go online to find that type of product or service. Well, your customers are going to do the same thing. All right, next question. All right, Marilyn Lindgren, uh, Facebook. How do you weed out all the people who are not even in your geographical area? Okay, that's a great question. Um, one of the things you want to do uh, when you're setting up your fan page is, first of all, not worry about where the people are that join the fan page. Okay? They will weed themselves out. Um, if your fan page is covering a whole bunch of information about yoga in general and it yields more interest, that is really cool. Now, beyond that, what you do is you have what are called landing pages, all right? And in your description of your business on your fan page, you can say where you are located. So if they see, for example, you're in California and the person on your fan page is from New York, they'll weed themselves out. Also, when people click to try a free lesson or to try two weeks of unlimited yoga for $30 or whatever your call to action is, um, what you can do on that page that requests their information is mention where your studio is located. So don't worry about finding a way to weed out people that are not even in your area. The more fans you have on your fan page, the more credible you will look on Facebook and you'll stand out. So do everything you can to attract everyone. But when it comes to actually following up and calling or messaging these people, from there you can see where they are on their, on their profile page. And in most cases, they're not going to contact you if they're outside of your region. Great question, Marilyn. I really appreciate that one. How to deal to the, the, the uh, economically challenged? Um, that's a good question. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a little more challenging. That pe I mean, uh, people use economics as a reason not to do something healthy for themselves. I sometimes, you know, talk, show them where they're spending their other money and, and what that's bringing them and, and how, you know, the little bit of money that they're going to be spending in your classes or your, with your services and how that's going to benefit them. A, a good example are yoga teachers. I know, if, and this is not to, you know, um, put anyone on the spot or anything, but how many, how many times have I been giving like a, a business workshop for yoga teachers and then this, the, this, the same people who really need it will come up and say, oh, I'd love to take your seminar, but I can't afford it. You know, I've heard, I hear that all the time. And so I just basically have to show them what they're going to benefit, how they're going to benefit by putting that, that investment. I do offer like payment plans and stuff like that for, for so if it's a big enough kind of training program and, and whatnot. And, and I, I've, I've all, I'm the type two in the past, like I've never really turned anyone down because of money. Like if someone comes to me, you know, to a certain extent, I'll, I'll you know, do what I can to help them out. But again, it's all, it, it's like showing them what, how they're going to benefit from it usually gives them incentive. Taking them from their pain into their pleasure gives them that incentive. Um, and I don't know if John wants to add anything to that. I think you pretty much nailed it there. Um, I'll, I'll take the next question. The only comment I would have on that one, Christine, is that um, one thing I experienced is when I was charging $150 a month um, versus when I was charging $30 a month. When I was charging $30 a month, I had a certain number of people every single month tell me that I, my, my lessons were too expensive and that coming to my studio was too expensive. The funny thing is over time as I gradually increased my price of my unlimited plan for monthly uh, memberships, when I got up to 150, the amount of people who told me I was too expensive was no different than when I was at $30. And we're not talking about inflation. We're just talking that in any market, there is typically a perception that 
you are too expensive within a certain percentage of people and it doesn't change. You could charge a dollar, you could charge a thousand dollars and in some cases the same amount of people will gripe about price. Now obviously there's a little you know bit of objectiveness on that. You, you got to find what is uh, economically sound in your area. You might not be able to charge 150, it might be 80 but certainly just understand that there will always be a group of people that will always say things are too expensive. Okay, so Shannon Crow, is it better to have a fan page on Facebook or to be an individual person on Facebook? Um, let me break this down for you. And again, uh, if you see the YouTube site down at the bottom, we have a Facebook fan page webinar there that breaks it all down step by step. So I'll give you the quick and dirty answer here, Marita. Um, oh, sorry, uh, Shannon. You have to have both. Um, in order to have a fan page, you must be a person on Facebook. So create your Facebook account profile first, and then from there create your fan page and be the administrator for it. You need both. Absolutely, you need both. And I can break that all down for you or just watch the, the uh, recording. Um, and Mark, I'm also going to just take this next one here from Marita. Uh, let me just put it in the uh, question box here. Okay. Facebook is so complicated. How can I learn to use it? I am paying for an ad that I cannot see. Okay, well, I love the fact that you got involved. First of all, let me take my hat off and applaud you for, for trying. Um, I understand it's easy to get lost. Not only can Facebook be complicated, but it's also distracting. As you know, uh, anybody here that uses Facebook, if you go there, even with the purpose of just to put up a post about your studio's uh, events for the week, you'll easily get distracted by messages from others, notifications from others, uh, the news feed, and so forth. So. What I can tell you is you absolutely must have a purpose before you log on to Facebook. Always know what your next move is so that once you've executed that move, you get off of it. Now, how can you learn more about how to use Facebook? Uh, I hate to sound like a broken record, but free information is the best way to do it. And I've got two answers for you, and I hope everybody can participate. Uh, number one, again, is that webinar. We talked about it. It's about an hour long, and it breaks it all down for you. Number two we have a free social media basics course. Um, I, I want to invite everybody here, everyone, to come and join this free course. You can do it. It's self-paced. There is zero cost. There is no sales stuff attached to it. It's just our gift uh, from Perfect Mind to small businesses on how to not make all the mistakes we made and waste all the time we wasted. So if you'd like to receive that, uh, a login to take that course and go through it for free, please send me an email. My email is right here in the box, I've, I've circled it. I'll also put it in the chat box. Just send me an email saying interested in taking the free social media course or something to that effect and I'll make sure I get you a login and you can get started on it. Um, it will save you a lot of time, a lot of money and it really demystifies all that kind of scary stuff around Facebook being something that won't get you results. Um, and last but not least, the ad that you cannot see, it's probably because you targeted interests that are not in your own profile. Uh, Facebook's got a really cool way that you only target the people that might have an interest in your service. And as you choose who you're trying to target, um, you yourself might not qualify as one of those targets, which would be why you don't see the ad. Uh, hopefully I answered your questions, Marita and Shannon. Okay, next question. We've got a little bit more time. Um, Let's, let's say two more questions, and then if anybody has questions beyond that, uh, you can certainly send me an email. Um, if those questions are from Mark, Mark, if you could put your e email address in the chat box and we can share it with everyone. I believe it's mark at uh, mindbodywarrior.com. And um, yeah, without further ado, if anyone has any further questions, please type them in the chat box, and we'll take two more. Okay, going once. Going twice. All right. Celine, thank you very much for the feedback. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank Mr. Mark Lehem. Thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate you sharing information with us today. And my biggest thank you has to go to all the 30 participants that showed up. I know all of you are busy, and I'm sure you have a lot of things going on getting ready for the holiday season. So thank you for taking an hour out of your day to come and listen to us. Um, if you have any suggestions for our next topic for our webinar, or if you could suggest what time of day works best for you, we pick 11 a.m. Pacific time um, just because that's what's worked for us in the past. But if uh, we're wrong, please let us know. Send me an email, john.malik at Perfect Mind, and let us know of any topics you'd like us to cover and what time of day will work best for you. Please check out our YouTube channel, and of course, check out our website, perfectmind.com. We offer social media services, management software, website design, and of course, automated bookkeeping. Um, 
Thank you again. This is John Malik for Perfect Mind signing off. Thanks, John.